10 cold cases that were solved years later. Crimes are committed every day, and we rely on law enforcement to go out and solve them so justice can be served. But sometimes, there just isn't enough evidence to lead the police to the truth, and a case goes cold. The show Cold Case aired for seven seasons, and other crime shows like CSI and Law and Order have been around for years. People are fascinated by the ways police and scientists interpret evidence to solve crimes, and with developing technology, there are new breakthroughs every single day, that could help solve a crime that was unsolvable years ago. Imagine not knowing what happened to a loved one? Or watching a person you know committed a crime, walk free because of lack of evidence? That is happening less and less these days because of new ways to interpret DNA, and a crime scene. If evidence is stored correctly, it is now possible for police to go back to cold cases, and take a fresh look at what happened. Here are 10 cold cases that were solved years later, thanks to the perseverance of investigators, advanced DNA technology, and a lucky break. 1. Crystal Bezlinowicz, solved 18 years later. Todd Bonner was a sheriff's deputy when he was dispatched in the cold morning hours of December 15, 1995 to the scene of a dead body on a bank of the Provo River. The nude body of Crystal Lynn Bezlinowicz, 17, was lying face down in the rocks, bloody and broken. For two years Bonner served as the lead investigator of a team that went all over the state in hopes of solving the Salt Lake teen's murder. But the trail went cold. It's a case that's haunted me for almost my whole career, Bonner said Thursday announcing that nearly two decades later, an arrest had been made. It's closure for me, as well. I'm very thrilled of the outcome, but it has taken a lot of time, and it has taken a lot of work. Bonner moved on in his career, never forgetting about the dead teenager, and rekindling hope when the case was reopened in 2006. New technology at the state crime lab in Sorensen Forensics, had made it possible to examine DNA evidence from the apparent murder weapon he helped collect years earlier, those large, granite rocks, as well as from under Bezlanowicz's fingernails. Two full-time detectives were assigned to the case in 2008, forensic technology kept improving and unified police were brought on board. More DNA was extracted off the rocks found near the girl's body. Bonner was elected Wasatch County Sheriff in 2009 but he regularly checked in on the case that had followed him for years. It's always in the back of your mind, all the investigators that I still associate with that were a part of this, it's always in the back of their minds," Bonner said. Every time we get together, we talk about it, and we have for 17 years. In January, the CODIS database returned a match for the DNA, Joseph Michael Simpson, 46 who served time in the Utah State Prison in the 1980s for murder, and now resided in Sarasota County, Florida Simpson previously lived in Clearfield. More forensic evidence from the scene was tested, providing an even stronger match for Simpson, but the Wasatch County Sheriff's Office needed more. With the help of law enforcement in Sarasota County, Bonner and another Utah detective tracked down Simpson, who was living with his mother, and set up surveillance. On August 25, they followed him to a smoke shop, where he smoked a cigarette and tossed it aside. Bonner now had the DNA investigators needed. It was a match. Bonner, flanked by detectives from Wasatch County and Florida's Sarasota County, was the one who put handcuffs on Simpson at his home Tuesday, telling him he was under arrest for the murder of Chris Lindbyslinowicz. The suspect. Simpson was booked into the Sarasota County Jail for investigation of aggravated murder. Investigators expect authorities to return him to Utah within the next few weeks. This won't be Simpson's first time facing a murder charge in Utah. Simpson was arrested in August of 1987 by Clearfield Police, and was convicted of murder in a Farmington court a couple of months later, according to court records. Simpson first arrived at the Utah State Prison in November of 1987. He was first paroled in April of 1995. In June of 1997, he received a travel permit while on parole, according to Department of Corrections spokesman Steve Jerk. 
he went to Nevada where he was arrested on a drug-related charge. Simpson spent a short time in jail in Nevada, before being extradited back to Utah to serve his sentence at the Utah State Prison in June of 1997, Jarek said. Simpson was paroled again in September of 1997, and completed parole in 2003. Simpson has been living in Florida for 13 or 14 years, the sheriff's office said. But Utah state court records show that Simpson was in Utah as recently as 2010, when he received a minor traffic citation in Syracuse. Until the DNA connection was made, Simpson had never been considered a suspect in the case, Bonner said. Investigators believe Bezlinowicz disappeared from North Temple, but offered few details about how she encountered Simpson or ended up in Wasatch County. Bezlinowicz grew up in Spokane. Washington her mother, Lynn Taresen, told the Deseret News in 1996 that her daughter was involved with drugs and was prostituting by age 15. Every time she came home she had her arms spread out wide and a big smile on her face. I never refused her. I always loved her, Taresen said then. Whatever she was doing, she thought, was more important than living a normal life. Bislinovich and her boyfriend had moved to Utah from Spokane just a few months earlier. He reported her missing two days after she failed to return, from a late-night trip to a Salt Lake convenience store. This week, Bonner made a phone call 18 years in the making, to a mother and her husband, concerning a daughter. They were, very relieved, very emotional, very happy that this is moving forward, he said, too. Jessica Keen solved 17 years later. Authorities say Marvin Lee Smith Jr. snatched a Columbus teenager from a bus stop, raped her and killed her 17 years ago. Now, he finally stands charged with her murder. A Madison County grand jury indicted Smith, 51, on Wednesday for aggravated murder, kidnapping and rape. He could get the death penalty if convicted. The cold case heated up in recent months when Smith's DNA matched evidence on file. The indictment was announced yesterday by Sheriff Jim Sabin. Smith is accused of killing Jessica and Keene, a 15-year-old Westland High School cheerleader in March 1991. Detectives say he took her from a bus stop in Wineland Park one evening, forced her into a vehicle and drove her to a Madison County cemetery. Evidence at the scene showed Jessica got away and ran for her life across ditches and fields, hiding behind or near tombstones as she tried to save herself. A cemetery visitor found her body two days later. She had been beaten to death. Madison County Prosecutor Steve Proni was pleased with the indictment, saying it validated the hopes of Sabin and agents of the Ohio Bureau of Criminal Identification and Investigation that the case would one day be solved. An Ohio law that took effect in 2005 requires DNA collection from all felons. Investigators only recently matched Smith's sample to evidence in the old case. Smith had served time in Ohio prisons and had to give a DNA sample back then. He was arrested in April in North Carolina after the DNA match was made. He was charged with corruption of a minor, a move that allowed authorities to hold him in jail while they awaited more test results. Jessica's family, which includes her parents and her sister, were at Smith's initial arraignment this month. Madison County victims advocate Carol Mead said that the family is not commenting at this time. Smith is expected in Madison County Common Pleas Court to face the new charges at 9 a.m. today before Judge Robert D. Nichols. He was sentenced to 30 years in prison. 3. Jimmy Casino, solved 21 years later. A Hawaii man already facing death penalty charges in, one of Orange County's most notorious cold case slayings was accused Friday of a second decades-old murder, the 1987 robbery shooting of a Pasadena market owner. Richard C. Morris Jr., 56, has been held without bail in the Orange County for nearly two years, after he was arrested in Hawaii and charged with the mob-style execution in Buna Park of topless bar owner Jimmy Casino in January 1987. On Friday, the Orange County District Attorney's Office lodged additional charges and special circumstances against Morris, accusing him of participating in the murder of Vincent Mejia, 64, 
On May 15, 1987, during a robbery at a neighborhood market in Pasadena, witnesses told police more than 20 years ago that two armed gunmen entered Mayia's market on Colorado Boulevard late in the afternoon and demanded money from the cashiers. Mayia came over to see to intercede and was shot once in the right chest. The bandits then grabbed money from the cash register and fled. Mayia died from his wounds about two weeks later. Morris was one of two men arrested by Pasadena police after the shooting, but he was never charged. Two decades later, Morris was allegedly liked by DNA evidence to the robbery murder of Jimmy Casino, the operator of the infamous Mustang Topless Theater on Harbor Boulevard in Santa Ana. The Mustang was the first and biggest topless club in Orange County, allowed in 1983 by a judge's decision that classified it as a theater rather than a nightclub, which protected its activities as freedom of expression. Casino, 48, whose real name was James Lee Stockwell, lived in a mansion in Anaheim Hills for a while with some of his dancers, and drove a Rolls Royce, a Mercedes-Benz 450 SL and a Chevrolet Camaro. He eventually moved into a two-story condominium near Los Coyotes Golf Course in Buna Park with his 22-year-old girlfriend. When they returned home shortly after midnight January 2, 1987, two masked and armed intruders were waiting in the darkness. They tied up and raped the girlfriend and shot Casino in the back of the head before ransacking the condo, stealing jewelry, furs, credit cards and two cars. The case went unsolved for decades before Morris was arrested, and charged with special circumstances murder in May 2008, after his DNA allegedly linked him to the crime scene. Orange County Deputy District Attorney Michael Murray said investigators, then looked into Morris' background and learned he had long been a suspect in Mayia's murder. Murray said the Mayia case was reopened, resulting in the charges being lodged Friday in Santa Ana. Morris was charged with the first-degree murder of Mejia, plus the special circumstances of committing a murder during the course of the robbery, and committing multiple murders. Morris is expected to be arraigned on the new charges on June 10, which is his next court date in the casino case. Murray said his office has jurisdiction to file the Mejia murder case in Orange County, even though the slaying took place in Pasadena under a penal code section that allows for out-of-county prosecutions in situations where there is, more than one special circumstances murder case. It is similar to the recently concluded prosecution in Santa Ana of serial killer Rodney James Alcala, who was tried in Orange County for the torture and strangulation murders of four women in Los Angeles, and the kidnap and murder of a 12-year-old girl from Huntington Beach in the late 1970s The execution of Casino in 1987 was the first in a series of mob-style shootings in Orange County, linked to financial control of the lucrative Mustang Topless Theater. Three months later a financial backer of the Topless Club was shot in the head and blinded. Two men were convicted and sentenced to life terms. And then in 1988 a bouncer and lingerie salesman at the Mustang, who had ties to the Mafia was killed execution style in an Irvin parking lot. That slain remains unsolved. The Mustang later burned to the ground in an arson caused fire and explosion. 4. Pamela Jackson and Cheryl Miller, solved 43 years later. Cheryl Miller and Pamela Jackson had planned to celebrate the end of the 1971 school year by gathering with classmates at a quarry along a gravel road. But the 17-year-old girls weren't known for frequenting parties, so when they didn't show up, other teens just assumed they had changed plans, perhaps to avoid any underage drinking or pot smoking. It soon became clear that the well-liked pair from the farming town of Alchester, SD, had vanished in their Studebaker. Now the 43-year-old mystery of their disappearance has been solved largely by the ebb and flow of a dirty creek and the contents of a well-preserved purse, which indicate the girls probably died after their car plunged into a creek. This has really been a tragedy for two families, a tragedy for a class, as well as all of South Dakota, to some degree, State Attorney General Marty Jackley said this week. The questions began on the evening of May 19, 1971. After visiting Miller's ailing grandmother at a hospital, 
The girls met up with some boys at a church parking lot and started to follow them to the quarry. Miller drove the beige 1960 Studebaker Lark that had belonged to her grandmother, who died shortly after she disappeared. Jackson was in the passenger seat. The boys missed a turn and accidentally drove past the party. When they turned around, they told authorities, they no longer saw the Studebaker's headlights. They figured the girls had simply lost the nerve to attend the party. The celebration went on, but the girls and the Studebaker would not be seen again until 2013. In the following weeks, volunteers and law enforcement officers searched the gravel pit, surrounding roads and even the nearby Missouri River. But their efforts yielded nothing. The mystery persisted, year after year, for more than four decades, tormenting the girls' families baffling investigators and inviting false allegations against a sex offender. Every time the girls' classmates reunited, the disappearance came up. We were always curious, said Dwight Iverson, a classmate who now runs a restaurant and convenience store in nearby Vermilion. We would talk about it. That car has to be somewhere on this planet, and it's never been found. At one point, the state's cold case unit reopened the investigation after a prison snitch implicated a fellow classmate who had lived nearby, and was behind bars for raping a woman. Authorities concluded he made the story up. Then in September, flooding followed by a drought brought the car into view. It was upside down in Brool Creek next to the gravel pit, where the girls had been headed. A fisherman spotted two tires sticking above the water. On Tuesday, Authorities held a news conference to confirm what townspeople had suspected since the car re-emerged, the remains inside were those of Miller and Jackson. The evidence seemed frozen in time. A picture of Mount Rushmore on the white license plate was clearly visible, as were the green registration numbers. A watch still had its strap and clearly showed the time it stopped, 10.20. Miller's purse was intact, containing her driver's license, coins, a couple of letters from friends and other items, all in relatively good shape for being submerged for so long. Those belongings and DNA were used to identify the remains. There's no evidence the teens had been drinking. And mechanical tests on the car did not suggest any foul play. The headlight switch on the dashboard was on. The car was in high gear, and both girls were found in the front seat. Those factors point to an accident. Jack Lee said. Investigators would not speculate on exactly what happened, though one of the tires was damaged and the tread was thin, Jack Lee added. Ray Hoffman, who knew the Miller family and searched for the teens during his career with the Vermilion Police Department, said the two probably lost track of the narrow, dusty road and accidentally drove into the creek. Those boys were kicking up gravel at nighttime. Those girls couldn't see the bridge, he said. Seeing an old car embedded in a muddy bank wouldn't necessarily attract suspicion. The landscape is dotted with rusting vehicles, farm machines and other contraptions. Some were put there to curb erosion. Others were simply abandoned. Jackson's late mother, Adele, told people the loss of a daughter was especially hard on her husband, Oscar. She said just about every night after supper, he'd go out driving around the countryside looking for that Studebaker said Paul Bum, publisher of the local newspaper, The Alchester Union and Hudsonite. Oscar Jackson died at age 102, five days before the car was found. An obituary noted that his daughter's disappearance was his greatest sadness. 5. Richard Phillips and Milton Curtis, solved 46 years later. It was one of the coldest cases in the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department's cold case file the unsolved murder of two young police officers here, after a traffic stop early in the morning of July 22, 1957. No major break in the investigation had occurred since 1960, when a Manhattan Beach homeowner found two watches, and a gun in his backyard and gave them to the police. The watches had been stolen from two teenagers assaulted in the area on the night of the killings. The gun was traced to a Sears in Shreveport, La but the trail went dead there. The case remained open but inactive for four decades, until, the police said, a tipster called detectives last September to identify the killer. 
The tip proved false, but as a result of reopening the case, the police decided to check fingerprints, they had had on file since 1957 against a nationwide computerized database set up by the FBI last February. The prints led to Columbia, SC, where early this morning the police arrested Gerald F. Mason a 68-year-old retired gas station owner living in a comfortable suburban tract northwest of town. He is being held without bond pending an extradition hearing. The police have found no record of any crimes committed by Mr. Mason since 1957, there was only one burglary charge in South Carolina from 1956. It was the fingerprints from that arrest that appear to match prints taken from the stolen car the presumed killer was driving the night that two El Segundo officers were shot. The police put Mr. Mason under surveillance weeks ago, and he apparently was unaware that he was being watched. He played golf on Tuesday and was arrested at his home at 7 a.m. today. Chris Mills, Mr. Mason's lawyer, said California had begun extradition proceedings. He said Mr. Mason was arrested on a fugitive warrant by a contingent of United States Marshals, and South Carolina and California law enforcement officers. The family is in shock, Mr. Mills said. We are talking about a man who has led a law-abiding life here for 42 years or more. Mr. Mason's neighbor of 10 years, Betty G. Wiggins, said, what gets me is why would it take so many years to find somebody who has been so well known here in Colombia. It's not like he was living like a fugitive, hiding or running away from something. That's why I just know they've got the wrong man. Miss Wiggins said Mr. Mason and his wife, Betty, have two daughters and three grandchildren. Relatives gathered at the home today. Mr. Mason's younger brother, Murray said he and the family believe the arrest is a case of mistaken identity. If he's ever even been in California, we don't know when it could have been, he said. The 1957 case of the Lover's Lane Bandit has haunted and frustrated the El Segundo Police, the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department and the Los Angeles County District Attorney's Office. Law enforcement officials reserve a special contempt for police killers, particularly the ones who elude capture for years. Around midnight on July 21, 1957, a man accosted two teenage couples necking in their cars along a well-known lover's lane on Van Ness Avenue in Hawthorne, just east of El Segundo. He tied up the four teenagers, robbed them, forced them to strip and raped a 15-year-old girl. He stole their 1949 Ford and drove off into the night, with the girls' skirts lying on the floor of the back seat. About an hour and a half later, officers Richard A. Phillips, 28, and Milton G. Curtis, 25, of the El Segundo police saw a car run a red light at Rosecrans Avenue and Sepulveda Boulevard, a quiet, undeveloped area of tall eucalyptus trees near a standard oil tank farm. The officers ordered the driver out of the car. Just then, a second El Segundo cruiser pulled up. The arresting officers waved the car on, thinking they had the situation under control. The driver then pulled out a .22 caliber snub-nosed revolver and shot both officers. Officer Phillips fired several shots at the fleeing car, and radioed for help before losing consciousness. Both officers died before reaching the hospital. Officer Phillips had two years on the job, Officer Curtis two months. The driver abandoned the car four blocks away and ran south into Manhattan Beach through yards and over fences, dropping the watches he had stolen from the teenagers, the police said, and his weapon. Despite a wide manhunt involving local, state and federal police, no further trace of the killer was found. The case was featured in True Detective magazine in 1958 with a plea for public help to solve the murders. We followed literally thousands of leads and tips, but with no success said Jack Waite, chief of the El Segundo police. But we certainly never forgot this case. The officers are long gone, but they never were forgotten. There was a flurry of activity three years after the shootings, when the watches and the gun were recovered, but it led nowhere. The case drifted into the inactive file. Early last year, the FBI established a database that for the first time compiled fingerprints from police agencies all over the country. 
law enforcement agencies began looking at old cases to see whether this new tool could help. The Los Angeles District Attorney's Office reopened 3,000 unsolved homicide cases dating to 1980 with the aid of the new database. But it did not look back 45 years until the El Segundo police received the tip in September. That's the way these things go sometimes, a fluke, a tip, said Captain Frank Merriman of the Los Angeles County Sheriff Department's Homicide Bureau, who oversaw the handling of the case. It turned out to be wrong this time, but it caused us to look in the right direction. The police had several good prints from the stolen car, which matched the prints from the 1956 South Carolina burglary arrest. No good prints were on the gun for comparison, because it had been in the ground for three years, Mr. Merriman said. He added that ballistics tests from the weapon were consistent with the bullets that killed the officers, but were not conclusive because of the poor condition of the gun. The authorities said one of the reasons it took so long to find Mr. Mason, a factor that may complicate any prosecution, was that he had led a spotless life since 1957. They said it is unusual for someone to commit a brutal crime just once. In the county's request for extradition, Mr. Mason is charged with two counts of murder and multiple counts of kidnapping, robbery and rape. There is no statute of limitations on murder, and the other charges can be brought because Mr. Mason had left California within three years of the crimes, which suspends the state statute of limitations. Steve Cool. The Los Angeles County District Attorney, said that he was barred from seeking the death penalty, because the California death penalty law on the books in 1957 was later invalidated by the United States Supreme Court. John Buterbois, 79, served on the El Segundo force with the two officers, and said today that he was shocked that someone had been charged in their killings. I thought it would never, never happen, Mr. Buterbois said outside the office of the El Segundo Police Department, from which he retired in 1971. The tragic part about the whole thing is that some of the old-timers I worked with are no longer around here to see this. 6. Lucy Johnson, solved 52 years later. A woman from Surrey, British Columbia, has been found alive after going missing more than 50 years ago. Her daughter's determination made the discovery possible. Lucy Johnson, now 77, was originally reported missing by her husband, Marvine, in May 1965, according to the Royal Canadian Mounted Police RCMP. Upon investigation, the police found that she actually hadn't been seen since September 1961. The discovery prompted a murder investigation, with Marvine Johnson as a suspect. He was never charged, though and the Surrey RCMP missing person unit learned he passed away in the late 1990s. Their daughter, Linda Evans, who was seven or eight when Johnson went missing, hoped to find her mother someday. This past June, Evans was inspired to continue the search after the Surrey leader ran a picture and profile of her mother as part of the RCMP's Missing of the Month series. With this series, the missing persons unit is appealing to the public to assist with solving these mysteries, and bring closure to these individuals' families and their loved ones, the RCMP explained on its website. Evans then decided to put an ad in the Yukon News, a newspaper in northern BC, the Surrey leader reported. She knew her mother was originally from the area. Shortly after, she received a phone call from a woman in Yukon, who said the woman in the ad was her mother too. It turned out that Johnson was living in Yukon with a new family, including four children. The original daughter of Lucy Johnson, who went above and beyond to promote and try to generate tips all over BC, actually somehow connected with a stepsister, who she did not know she had at the time, Corporal Bert Pocket, spokesman for Surrey RCMP, told CBC News on Thursday. The stars aligned, the timing was perfect. Upon hearing the news, Evans told the Surrey leader that she has a lot of questions, but she's excited to visit her mother. I just hope I can be a part of her life, she told the paper. I'll just give her a big hug and hope the words come easy. 7. Eaton Pats, solved 33 years later. Police today arrested a former grocery worker in the 1979 murder of Eaton Pats, 
apparently ending a mystery of what happened to the six-year-old boy that has haunted New York City for three decades. Pedro Hernandez, 51, confessed to police that he lured Pats to his death with the promise of a soda. He took police back to the basement of a Manhattan bodega and showed them where he claimed he strangled Pats. He said he stuffed the boy's body into a plastic garbage bag, carried it to another location in the Soho neighborhood and dumped it in the trash. Police Commissioner Ray Kelly said Hernandez provided no motive for the killing. Pats, a handsome blonde boy, vanished on the first day he was allowed to walk to the school bus stop alone on May 25, 1979. Friday will be the 33rd anniversary of his disappearance. Kelly said detectives were drawn to Hernandez in recent days, because Hernandez had told family members and friends as early as 1981, that he had done a bad thing and killed a child in New York. It was one of those family members or friends, who alerted police following renewed interest in the case, when police excavated the basement apartment of a building on the same block last month where Pats lived and Hernandez worked. Kelly said police had informed Pats's parents, who have for years wondered what happened to their six-year-old son. We only hope these developments bring some measure of peace to the family, Kelly said. Pats's father, Stan Pats, was a little surprised, but after all the things he has gone through he handled it very well, said Lt. Chris Zimmerman, head of the Night Missing Persons Unit. Investigators are convinced they finally have the right man given the fact that he had told others in the past and the specificity of his statement, Kelly said. Hernandez was remorseful and indicated a feeling of relief, opening up to detective in three hours of questioning, Kelly said. Hernandez, he said, gave them a written and signed confession as well as a videotaped confession. Kelly said there was no reason at this time to believe Pats had been sexually abused. But when asked whether the boy had been dismembered, Kelly said, the investigation is continuing. Pats who disappeared on a rainy New York day not unlike the one on which Hernandez was arrested, launched the modern missing persons movement and led to missing children being featured on milk cartons. Hernandez was taken into custody at his residence in Maple Shade, NJ, on Wednesday morning where he lives with his wife and daughter. The apartment is rented by his wife. Rosemary Hernandez, who let her husband move in after he told her that he was dying of cancer. We never had a problem with him, Hernandez's brother-in-law, Jose Lopez, told Q, a CBS station in Philadelphia. There was never a problem. He was a normal person. Never gave any sign that he did something like that. If Lopez could speak to Hernandez now, I would tell him, why didn't you confess years before, years ago? instead of suffering through all these years and letting this father and mother and this family suffer. Why didn't you do it? Why didn't you confess if you did it? Dot. I hope you're in peace now with yourself. New York City police officers accompanied by local cops took Hernandez into custody at his New Jersey home at 7.30 a.m. Wednesday and brought him to the Camden County, NJ, prosecutor's office for initial questioning. He was then taken to New York City for additional questioning by authorities there. Police have named other suspects in the past, but none had ever been arrested or charged. Mayor Michael Bloomberg declined to provide details today, but said, a person of interest is in custody and being questioned. Manhattan District Attorney Cy Vance, who reopened the case Pat's case when he was elected in 2010, has not commented on the arrest. The search for Eden has been one of the largest, longest-lasting and most heart-wrenching hunts for a missing child in the country's recent history. His photo was among the first of a missing child to appear on a milk carton. Eden Pat's case has a new suspect. Hernandez was taken into custody one month after the investigation into Pat's disappearance returned to the headlines when police excavated a Manhattan basement in the hopes of finding evidence about the boy's death. At the time, police named Othnell Miller as a suspect. The dig focused on a basement room where Miller once operated a workshop. The dig yielded no obvious human remains and little forensic evidence that would help solve the decades-long mystery of what happened to the boy. The boy's parents, Stan and Julie Pats, 
were reluctant to move or even change their phone number in case their son tried to reach out. They still live in the same apartment, down the street from the building that was examined in April, 8. Mia Zapata, solved 10 years later. For the past 10 years, several Seattle police detectives, and King County prosecutors have worked to solve the July 1993 murder and rape of Mia Zapata. Based on investigators' reports, it seems the team developed a soft spot for the 27-year-old punk singer. The prose surrounding the hard facts of her murder in court documents is touching, and indicates that the team sensed how significant Zapata's death was. That team got a break late last month and shocked Seattle on Saturday, January 11, by announcing an arrest. Over the past several days, details of the case have leaked out, along with the tears of Zapata's friends and admirers, who mourned her death all over again. The story of Zapata, lead singer of the Gits, inspiration for the anti-violence organization Home Alive, and a Seattle legend, may finally be put to rest. With DNA evidence the public didn't know existed, Detectives Richard Gannon and Greg McSell found their man last month, Jesus C. Mezquia, a 48-year-old Cuban native. Mezquia landed in Florida's DNA database in December, after finishing probation for a possession of burglary tools conviction. He was matched with a saliva sample from Zapata's body, saved presciently in 1993 by the King County Medical Examiner's Office that Seattle investigators submitted to a database search last June. Mezquia, a tall man with a tattoo on one finger, is in the Miami area jail, and has indicated that he will fight extradition to Washington. A new Florida law, passed in 2001, helped pinpoint Mezquia. The law expanded Florida's DNA database last year to include robbers and burglars. By 2005, all Florida felons will be in the database, which is already one of the country's largest. Washington state has rejected a similar all felons database proposal, if not for the new law, Mezquia probably wouldn't have made it into the database, despite his lengthy record, convictions for aggravated battery of a pregnant woman in 1997, kidnapping, false imprisonment, robbery, and indecent exposure in the early 1980s in Florida and battery of a spouse and assault to commit rape in California in the late 80s and early 90s. Detective Gagnon and senior deputy prosecuting attorney Timothy Bradshaw's court statements are written tenderly. In his request for $4 million bail for Mezquia, Bradshaw argues that Mezquia has maintained silence about the murder of an unarmed, special woman whose promising future was strangled. Since Saturday, Zapata's friends have been forced to relive her grisly death. On that Tuesday evening, July 6, Zapata rehearsed at Pancreas Production Studio, behind the Pike Street and 11th Avenue Winston Apartments. At 8.30 p.m., she joined friends at the Comet Tavern, a block away at Pike and 10th Avenue. Zapata had been drinking all day, and continued drinking at the Comet even venturing a few blocks to Pai Cara's pizza for hard alcohol. She returned to the tavern, and kept drinking until midnight. At midnight, she left the comet to look for her boyfriend at the studio. He wasn't there, so she went upstairs to a friend's apartment. At 2 a.m., Zapata left, saying she'd catch a cab to her Rainier Valley apartment. At 3.20 a.m., a prostitute found Zapata's body where the dead end 24th Avenue met Yesler Way, near an empty field. The prostitute said Zapata's body was in the street, next to the curb, positioned with her arms outstretched. Zapata had been raped, and strangled with the drawstring of her black git sweatshirt. There has been speculation that Zapata was the victim of a serial killer, perhaps the Green River Killer, because of her body's quasi-religious pose and the brutality of her murder. Others suspected that the killer was an acquaintance in her social circle or, as is now believed, that the suspected killer was a total stranger. Investigators haven't found evidence that Zapata knew Mezquia. A suspicious incident occurring a month, after Zapata's death may provide a clue about her last hour. Five weeks after Zapata's murder, a young woman walking along 10th Avenue near Union Street, just a block away from the Comet Tavern, 
saw a car trailing her. According to court documents, the woman thought the driver wanted to offer her a ride. But she noticed the driver was masturbating. The woman wrote down the license plate number and got away. Detectives recently discovered that the license plate was registered to Mezquia. It's possible that Zapata met Mezquia the same way, walking away from the Winston apartments on the night of her death. The 5 feet 8 inches Zapata wouldn't have been much of a match for the 6 feet 4 inches, 240 pound Mezquia, especially after a night of drinking. Prior police statements indicate that Zapata was probably killed in a house or car, and dumped where the prostitute found her. Mezquia lived in a Leshy apartment, which investigators say was a natural, direct drive from the Comet Tavern and, from the spot, where Zapata was discarded to die. 9. Lisa Re Kimmel Lil Miss Dash solved 14 years later. On a little used suspension bridge outside Casper, Wyoming, residents reported seeing unexplained lights in the early morning hours of March 26, 1988. Under the cover of darkness, a killer brought his victim to the bridge. After stabbing her repeatedly, he threw her into the chill waters of the North Platte River. The victim was later identified as 18-year-old Lisa Marie Kimmel from Billings, Montana. She had been sexually assaulted, then killed in a manner, that suggested some kind of bizarre torture. Lisa was last seen alive on the night of March 25, and police believe that she was killed a few hours later. But what complicates the investigation is that many people claimed, to have seen Lisa Marie Kimmel, or her car during the week when police believe she was already dead. At the time of her murder, Lisa Marie Kimmel was living in Denver, Colorado. On March 25, she left town and headed for Cody, Wyoming, to visit her boyfriend. According to her friend Ed Jurok, Lisa's car carried the spunky license plate, Lil Miss. The plan was that she was supposed to leave Denver and get to Cody to see me, sometime late that evening. I talked to her about 4.30, and she thought she'd be in about midnight or something like that. Weather conditions were good, so Lisa should have made the trip to Cody in 8 or 9 hours. She was expected at her boyfriend's house late Friday night. But by Saturday morning, she still had not arrived. Ed Rock frantically telephoned authorities in three different states. Later, patrolman Alan Lesko of the Wyoming Highway Patrol reported, that he stopped Lisa for speeding the night she disappeared. I was patrolling southbound on March 25, and I noted a small car northbound at 88 miles per hour, according to my radar. I turned around and pursued the car. I stopped her, near Orn Junction. She was well kept, kind of person you'd like to have for a daughter. Lisa's signature on the ticket verified her identity. It would be the last confirmed sighting of Lisa Marie Kimmel. As the week went on without any word from her daughter, Lisa's mother began to worry. The outlook was looking a little grim, but even if that, even if the outcome wasn't as we hoped, we still needed to find her. On April 2nd, one week after Lisa disappeared, Greg Bradford, a mechanic who was spending his Saturday fishing on the North Platte River, brought the search for Lisa Marie to a sad end, when I stepped up off the side of the bank. I looked over my shoulder and I saw the lady in the water. And then I remember when we were driving up from Cheyenne, they said this young girl was missing from Montana. So, I looked again, and said, oh my god, it must be her. Police searched the area where Lisa's body was discovered. On an old highway bridge, one quarter of a mile away, they found blood that was the same type as Lisa's. Because the bridge is so inaccessible and so seldom used, police concluded that the murderer probably lived in the area. Based on the eyewitness accounts of unexplained activity on the bridge, they estimated that Lisa was murdered early Saturday morning, roughly five hours after she was stopped for speeding. But soon, authorities began receiving information that complicated their investigation. Numerous eyewitnesses were reporting that they had seen Lisa's car. According to Sheriff Ron Ketchum of the Natronia County Sheriff's Department, some even claimed they had seen Lisa herself. We've had over a thousand sightings of this vehicle. A lot of them from law enforcement officers. 
and we were deluged with them at the point that we thought they had gone to Canada. We had some sightings in Canada. One of the most reliable sightings occurred roughly 10 hours after Lisa was supposedly killed. Donna Kirkpatrick, the wife of a local county sheriff, reported that she had seen Lisa driving her car in the city of Buffalo, Wyoming. It was Saturday at noon, and I noticed a little black sports car had pulled out right in front of me. Then I noticed the license plate. It was a Montana license plate with little miss on it. And, at that point I decided that I needed to see, if the car went with whoever was driving it. I am absolutely positive there was a young gal driving it. There's not a doubt in my mind. Another eyewitness reported seeing Lisa more than a day after police believe she was murdered. But this sighting was in Casper, Wyoming, more than 100 miles from Buffalo. Diana Houston was driving through Casper when a car with an out-of-state license plate caught her attention. It was Sunday afternoon, and I saw a Montana license plate on a vehicle. And being from Montana, it caught my eye. So I looked, and the license plate said, Little Miss. I went by I saw somebody with blonde hair driving, and had on a yellow sweater. Lisa was last seen at 9 p.m. on Friday night and was reported missing by 9 o'clock a.m. Saturday morning. Yet she was reportedly seen twice later that day and once on Sunday. If Lisa was alive, why hadn't she showed up at her boyfriend's or her parents' house? And if she had been killed early Saturday morning as police suspect, who was driving the car with Lisa's distinctive license plates? 14 years after Lisa Marie Kill was murdered, the Wyoming DNA database matched an inmate named Dale Wayne Eden to the crime. When police searched Eden's property, they found Lisa's car buried underground. Lisa had been held there for six days. Eden was tried for murder and other charges. The jury found him guilty and he was sentenced to death. The sightings of Lisa Marie Kimmel were never explained. Lisa's parents were awarded Dale Eden's property in a civil suit and burned the buildings to the ground. 10. Sherry Rasmussen, solved 23 years later. The weeping widower of a woman murdered 26 years ago, testified Wednesday about a love triangle that prosecutors believe led his former lover, then a Los Angeles police officer, to kill his wife. Defendant Stephanie Lazarus avoided the gaze of witness John Ruetten, as he said he never considered Lazarus to be his girlfriend, even though they had a long sexual relationship. What was your understanding of the relationship? Deputy District Attorney Shannon Presby asked. We were good friends, Mr. Ruetten said. We saw each other on and off, and on some of those occasions we had sexual intercourse. The tall, gray-haired Mr. Ruetten was overcome several times during his testimony, pulling tissues from a box on the witness stand, to wipe his eyes as he spoke of Sherry Rasmussen, his murdered wife. He also told of his friendship with Lazarus that dated back to their days as students at UCLA. There was only necking and fooling around in their college years, he said. Jurors were shown pictures of them together as college kids, including one of Mr. Ruetten with his arm around Lazarus in her cap and gown at graduation. Mr. Ruetten, 53, wearing a dark business suit testified that he met Rasmussen in 1984 at a party and they quickly became a couple. When they were engaged, he said, he felt no need to tell Lazarus because he had not seen her for months. However, he said she later learned of the engagement, summoned him to her condo and through tears expressed her love for him. She also asked him to have sex with her, which he said he did but now considers a stupid move. He stressed that nothing changed that night. Here's the deal, he said. It was clear she was very upset, that I was getting married and moving on. Later, he said, he confessed the incident to Ems Rasmussen and told her, don't let this mess us up. I want nothing more in the world than to be married to you. He also said he ended all contact with Lazarus, who has pleaded not guilty to the murder of Ems Rasmussen. Mr. Ruetten identified blissful photos of the couple's wedding on November 23, 1985. Lazarus did not look up as the photos flashed on a courtroom screen. Ems Rasmussen was killed on February 24, 1986, bludgeoned and shot to death by an intruder at the condo where she and Mr. Ruetten lived. 
prosecutors are trying to show that Lazarus sought revenge for being spurned by Mr. Ruetten. Another witness, retired Los Angeles police officer Mike Hargreaves, said he lived at Lazarus' condo for a year and recalled that she woke him once in the middle of the night and said Mr. Ruetten had broken up with her. She said John told her he was going to marry someone else, Mr. Hargreaves said. He said Lazarus, who was exceptionally fit, suggested they do buddy sit-ups together and she felt better after that. Mr. Ruetten's sister, Gail Lopes, showed jurors a letter to her mother from Lazarus that was postmarked August 6, 1985. In it, Lazarus told Mrs. Ruetten, I'm truly in love with John and the past year has really torn me up. I wish it didn't end the way it did, and I don't think I'll ever understand his decision. In subsequent years, Lazarus married and adopted a daughter. She rose to the rank of detective and was honored for her work in the art forgery section. She was arrested in 2009 after forensic experts, examining the file on Rasmussen's murder, linked her DNA to a bite mark on the slain woman's arm.